All right, everyone, let's get into it, eh? So, good morning. Um, yesterday, really well done, everyone. Um, so, the pump designs that came in, um, for the most part, they're all really good-looking pump designs. Uh, you all got the CD or discs or whatever together in time, and everyone submitted a pump, so um, well done. Um, they're all on the printer now, and I'm slowly working my way through them. Um, I will let you know as, uh, as they're ready to pick up. They'll be ready when you pick it up. You'll pick it up from Melissa. Um, I will put all of the bearings and seals there. Everyone gets a seal, obviously. Um, and some of you might need two bearings, some of you might need one bearing, and some of you might need none. I'll put a box of bearings with Melissa. So when you go collect your pump, and then you'll need to grab two, one or no bearings depending on what your group uh, requires. Now, two maximum per group because obviously if you start grabbing multiples then, um, then we're going to run out of bearings and, and some groups aren't going to have any. Um, so that's, that's that, but that will be in the, in the coming weeks. So I've got 27 pumps to print and they take anywhere between 4 and 10 hours each, so I'll just be cycling through them progressively. Um, so, uh, we are week 12. Uh, you guys will be working through your report. Um, everyone's familiar with the idea that that's due on Monday of swap back, so not next week, Monday of the week after. So you've got a little bit of time left, but um, certainly you want to be most of the way through the first 60%, I guess, by now. Um, so if, if you're not, uh, things will get more and more hectic towards the back end of semester, so try and put the hours in now. Um, next week, Monday is our quiz. So Monday is our quiz. Uh, you'll remember that that quiz will be orthographic drawing, it will be isometric drawing, it will be that project management stuff, so that's critical network or critical path network and so forth. Um, and it might also be a couple of worded questions about you know, all of the engineering disciplines following last lecture and this lecture. Um, ordinarily I give you guys 50 minutes for that and everyone uh, freaks out and doesn't get all of the drawings done. So this year um, I've decided to give you, what did I say, uh, 50, 60, 70 minutes. So an extra 20 minutes, okay? We've got a two hour lecture to put it in. So we'll start at two o'clock on the dot and we'll finish at 10 past three. All right, so there'll be an extra 20 minutes to get through both those drawings and the project management stuff. So hopefully that gives you enough time to, to work your way through the problems, okay? Um, yeah, so be there nice and early. Make sure you practice those drawings over and over and over again so that you can do them quickly because you will need to have practiced them to even get it done in that amount of time. Um, and then we'll be good. And then next Wednesday will be our very last lecture and I'll be covering exam techniques. So when you come into an exam, what do you do? How do you study for that exam? How do you most efficiently use your two or three hours in the exam room? Um, and how do you make sure that you don't freak out when you get there? All right, so that will be Wednesday's lecture, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that sort of stuff, and hopefully that's the last kind of part of you know, helping you guys out for university life. All right, so today, once again, we're hitting that number one, what do engineers do? We're going to be talking about chemical engineers, and we're going to be talking about electrical engineers, and you see you have your form in front of you there. Once again, we're going to be thinking about how chemical and electrical engineers marry up or match up with our, with our um, grand challenges. All right, so once again, let me just get one of these so I can fill it out when we get to it. Once again, I have the streams diagram that hopefully gives you some idea or basis as to what the subcategories or the subdisciplinary streams are for each of these disciplines, okay? So obviously you get an engineering degree and that's very, very broad and then you need to specialise and you will choose perhaps something along the lines of one of these streams and even within that then there'll be specialisation as you work in, the, you know, in a graduate position. So this is to give you a bit of an understanding of what subjects are offered and how they relate to one another, but it's not the be all and end all and there are other, other areas that you can study within these disciplines. So in chemical engineering our streams, once again project management or engineering management, um, we've talked about that, we had a lecture on it, so you should understand that pretty well. We've got chemistry, process engineering, control and thermofluids and I'll talk a little bit about the sorts of jobs and things associated with those. 
All right, so the first thing's chemistry. Who thinks a chemical engineer needs to understand chemistry? It's pretty fundamental, all right? So um, chemistry is, these subjects are the actual, if you were doing a, a, a chemistry degree, like a Bachelor of Science at, ma majoring in chemistry, these subjects are some of the backbones of that degree. All right. You need to understand chemistry. So a chemical engineer takes chemical processes and a lot of the time their job is scaling it up and making it work for high production or making it work for, you know, in industry. All right. But you can't do that without the fundamental chemistry. All right. And so this stream and this uh, selection of subjects is really basing you in that fundamental chemistry. I've got some lists there, but I've also got some pictures. The main thing is, uh, so the first subject is largely the theory, so chemical equations and how do you work out, you know, how much of this material will be made if I add these two materials together and that kind of stuff, so a lot of the chemical theory. Um, it's uh, lab work, so doing experiments and how do you set up experiments, how do you safely conduct yourself in a lab and uh, what do you actually find out and, and start to relate that theory to the lab practice. Um, and then also analytical chemistry is uh, the third subject in that stream. And that's basically, here's a substance, what is it? All right. And so a, chem a chemical engineer and a chemist needs to be able to take some sort of sample of that and do mass spectrometry or you know, all of these other different techniques to work out based on chemical composition what a particular item is. It's very important. Um, and so the, the, the end of that stream is related to that. So it's fundamental chemistry stuff that then gets scaled up uh, if you actually do sort of process engineering or something like that. All right, the main one, and chemical engineering you'll see has a very, very big stream and a couple of little streams where some of the other disciplines have sort of fairly uniform streams. Chemical engineering is really focused on process engineering. All right? And whilst that's a single stream, there's hundreds of different areas of process that that could actually be. Okay? And so some examples I've given you there, uh, the first one that I was talking about is upscaling. So, good example, shampoo. All right? At some point, a chemist in a lab came up with the new Pantene <laughs> formula that made their hair feel real fluffy and lovely and whatever. All right? They made that with test tubes and, and whatnot and they're, aha, I've got it. Now I need to fill every Woolworths in Australia and every, you know, Peapod shop, <coughs> whatever, Peapod stop and shop in America and every, every store in the world with Pantene, all right? How do I turn this test tube thing into that level of production? That's a chemical engineer, all right? So a chemical engineer takes a chemical process that creates something and goes, all right, now how do I make absolute buttloads of it really quick? Uh, and you design the whole process such that that chemistry happens on a really large scale. Uh, you can think of almost anything. Um, beverages, so Coca-Cola, beer, wine, uh, you know, even, even to things like bottled water and cordials and things like that. They make them at a mass scale. How do you set up all of those processes? Foods, any sort of production of foods, drugs. So you're not making Panadol in a lab with test tubes, you're making Panadol on a massive big production scale. All right, so how do you do that labor laboratory work except on a large scale? Um, and any sort of, sort of consumer products, etc. Um, so that's one type of process. Another type of process, everyone do, basically takes advantage of it when you turn the tap on. Process of water, so water treatment. So that water that you drink in Townsville comes from Ross River, and what do they do? Just basically pump it out of the river and pump it to your taps? No, what do we do? We process it, we clean it, we make sure there's no bacteria. There's actually a couple of really good YouTube videos that I've put up on Learn JCU that cover exactly what happens in the processing of water. And funnily enough, they don't put it through a bunch of filters and they don't evaporate it and condense it and they don't do the sorts of things that you might do if you were on a desert, deserted island and wanted to, you know, make water. Effectively, they add a bunch of chemicals to it and then they add a bunch of other chemicals that take the first chemicals out of it and then they add some more chemicals to take the second chemicals out of it. And by the time you get to the end, you have relatively clean water. 
All right, so it's mass production stuff. It's not putting it through a sieve and a filter and boiling it. It's adding a bunch of chemicals that then take other chemicals out and then you spin it so that all of the bad stuff goes to the bottom and all of this kind of stuff. So those YouTube videos cover that much better than I can because I'm not a chemical engineer, but that's a major area of chemical engineering. Waste treatment. So every time you flush the toilet, that goes somewhere and at some point that ends up in the ocean. Um, but it doesn't end up directly in the ocean. You've got to take a lot of stuff out of that first. And once again, it's not about filtering things out. It's about adding a bunch of chemicals and changing the chemical <coughs> composition and making solids come out and then spinning them off and collecting them and all of that kind of stuff. So that's chemical processes and chemical engineers run the show there. Uh, minerals processing. Every single bit of metal and um, effectively everything comes out of rock. And at one point it's a rock. And at some point, it's a nice consumer metal that we can make into something. And the process to get it out of the rock is all chemical engineering. All right? And at some stage, chemists probably had some sort of an input into how do you turn from A to B. But again, that's small scale. And the chemical engineer turns it into giant plant, many you know, thousands of tons of throughput. Okay? Um, bioengineering. Has everyone seen MBD over the road from engineering over there? What are they doing? They're growing algae. Yeah. Remember in our Grand Challenges, we said that at some point, uh, if, if all the cows die or have nowhere to live, um, we're going to have to eat algae. Um, chemical engineers are going to be the ones that actually turn that algae into food, hopefully. Um, and they're the ones that are turning algae into fuels and biofuels. And at the moment, what MBD is doing is turning a lot of the algae into food for cows. So, so actual cattle feed. So you, you sort of pelletise it and then the cattle eat that and then we eat the cattle. So um, chemical engineering is how you turn algae into other stuff in bioengineering. Oil and gas, uh, carbon sequestration, you don't just pump the gas down to the ground, you have to actually consolidate it and, and liquefy it and all of that sort of stuff. Um, materials manufacture, so just about every type of materials from you know, the, the acids in your battery to the fabrics on the chairs a chemical engineer has had something to do with. Um, and above all of that, chemical engineers generally manage whole of process. All right, so if you're in a mine, chances are a chemical engineer is the one standing above you making sure the whole system works together. If you're in a refinery, a lot of the time it's a chemical engineer making sure the whole process is working. Because process engineering, understands a lot of the, the little subsections where a mechanical engineer might deal with the pumps and some of the machinery and that sort of stuff and a civil engineer might make sure all the infrastructure works. A chemical engineer is the one managing what's actually happening, throughput and production. Okay, so that's, that's the last part of that process engineering. And here's a couple of examples. So that top left picture is natural gas pipeline. Alright, so what do you do with gas? How do you get it out of the ground? And what do you do with it? Once it's out of the ground, how do we get it to consumers or boats or wherever, however we're getting it there? This is a picture of some algae. This is a bunch of anodes in a copper refinery. How do we get copper out of the ore? Well, there's a couple of processes at the mine first. It turns it into, I think it's 96% it's 90, pure once it comes to the copper refinery just outside of town on the way south. Yeah, about 96, 97% pure. That is rubbish copper, all right? You cannot put 97% pure copper in a wire and expect to have any sort of an electrical transmission. So what they do is they put these anodes down there and then they have an electric process that basically picks up all the pure copper and then deposits on a cathode or vice versa because I'm not a chemical engineer. Ask one of them. Um, and that process then takes you 96, 97% pure to 99.99 and a lot of 9% pure. And that's really great wire copper. So that's really great electric, electric conductivity. Okay? So that process is a very basic, probably in the first time you do a chemical equation, you'll learn the, the anode cathode type equation for how copper will deposit up from one thing to another thing. But this is on a really huge scale and how you manage that whole process is process engineering. And then this picture is water treatment down the bottom there. So that's one aspect of that. But once again, I think there's a YouTube video on water treatment that you can watch that I've put on, on LearnJCU there. All right, control. Do you think chemical engineers need to understand control? 
There's plenty of processes. Chances are there's a computer running that process. So a chemical engineer needs to understand at least at a fundamental level what control systems do and how they integrate with systems. Um, so that managing the copper production, for example, you have all sorts of sensors making sure that those copper anodes and cathodes aren't bridging. Because if you have uh, basically the deposit come up unevenly and connect between the two, you know, all of the electricity is going to go through that connection and none of the copper is going to be coming off and depositing. So you have all sorts of sensors that control the process working out whether that is or isn't happening. And then funnily enough, you get guys with big sticks going around and just like knocking them off, standing on top of the whole thing and banging these connections off such that it works efficiently again. So you've got very advanced control systems telling very, uh, let's say, coarse or rudimentary approaches to removing a problem. All right, and thermofluids. And my favorite thermofluid example, beer. All right, so when you have a massive big brewery, and so let's think of the brewery in town. So they make their own beer. That's a fairly small scale. They can make enough beer to sell a few and sell them over the bar, right? That's a, a, a relatively big process. A chemical engineer would have designed that. Now you're Heineken, and you're making enough beer to fill a container ship. You have to do the same process, have all sorts of quality control because the brewery has quality control in so much as someone goes and sips it and goes, yep, that's good. If you're making a container ship worth of Heineken beer, you do not have someone, or maybe you do, but you probably don't have someone sipping enough of that beer to, to actually make sure it's okay. So you have all sorts of chemical processes in the quality control as well as designing the whole process to make that beer in the first place. And it's thermofluids because what is beer? It's a liquid. And liquid's got to go from A to B and it, throughout the process, so you need to understand hydrodynamics. And you're also heating it. And so many chemical processes require heating and cooling and all of that sort of good gear. And so you need to understand the thermodynamics as well as the hydrodynamics, so heating, cooling and fluid flow so that you can actually understand the process. And beer is a good example because you've got both hydrodynamics, thermodynamics and chemical engineers doing everything in the middle. Cool? All right, so that's my examples of chemical engineering for you. It is a very mechanical engineer's view of chemical engineering, so I can guarantee you if you talk to Madoc, he'll have much more information on what chemical engineers do. Oh, one comment. Chemical engineers do a heap of really good sustainability stuff. Again, referring back to the whole of process view, generally the ones that have to control that process and make sure it's sustainable are chemical engineers. So I haven't mentioned sustainability here, but there's probably more sustainability in the chemical degree than the other three um, because chemical engineers in processes need to understand that. Okay? Um, all right, so now spend a couple of minutes, look at your form. Um, and uh, yeah, probably in five minutes we'll talk about how chemical engineering aligns with those grand challenges the same way we did in the last lecture. All right, looks like everyone's had a bit of a go at this. So let's just go through them and have a quick discussion and then we'll move on to electrical. Uh, so make solar energy economical. Who's making solar energy economical? So. Is there any chemistry involved? Could be. Could be. Yeah, so there's fundamental chemistry and then there's process chemistry. So largely one of the biggest things that chemical engineers can do with solar energy is materials. So what material do you make the solar cell out of and how does that actually work? And also, um, solar energy isn't just PV on your roof. Think of the giant big mirror Solar, solar energy power plants where all the mirrors point all of the sunlight at a single point at the top of a tower, what does that heat do there? You collect it generally. Um, generally you either on the spot you boil water and that's a very inefficient way to do it. Chances are what you do is you actually take salt and you melt it and you have molten salt and then you store that and then that, that molten salt is then used to drive steam turbines. Okay? And so the process of 
Salt to molten salt to steam turbines and all of that sort of stuff, that's all chemical engineering. So it's not just making solar PV more efficient in materials, but it's also that whole process for the much larger scale power generation. Um, all of that's chemical engineering. So definitely chemistry, certainly process engineering. If you've got big scale stuff, control systems, maybe the chemical engineer more needs to know about control systems than the designing of them. We'll talk about designing them in electrical in a second, but maybe. And certainly thermofluids if you're talking about those, those molten, um, molten silica or whatever. Uh, provide energy from fusion. Does a chemical engineer do anything to that? It's a process for starters. What else? Yeah, so all sorts of chemical reactions when you're actually talking about fusion um, of atoms, what materials are using. You've got physicists doing a lot of that stuff, but the chemical engineers would be the ones taking this, the little physics in a lab and turning it into large-scale process. So certainly process engineering. Probably thermofluids because that stuff gets hot. And then why do we fuse atoms together? Basically to make heat. What do we do with the heat? Yeah, so heat is fundamentally just a form of energy and the only way that we ever generate electricity from heat is through heating up steam, steam turbines. So once again, the same sort of process, that steam process. Um, so nuclear power, it, you know, you don't fuse atoms together and plug it into the, into the grid. All that's doing is producing heat. Coal power, all that's doing, you're burning it, you're producing heat. Um, just about every large-scale production of electricity in some way produces heat and then that heat drives a turbine and then the turbine is what produces the electricity. So um, again, some heating there. Develop carbon sequestration methods. Yeah, chemistry, definitely. So we need to turn that carbon gas into carbon fluid or pellets would be even better, but what else? Process, yeah, you've got a lot of carbon coming out of everything that you're going to have to deal with, very large scale, so at the very least these two. Uh, manage the nitrogen cycle. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, nitrogen's going into waterways, nitrogen's going into the water treatment plants, nitrogen's running off all over the place. So how do you get that nitrogen back? Um, there's, there's all sorts of ways to try and recover that, particularly in water treatment process. You, if you can recover some of that, you can actually produce a lot of nitrogen from that. But, you know, there's, there's definitely management around those things and potentially even thermofluids in so much as it's a lot of the time running off in water. Um, access to clean water, clearly. Um, probably even some control there. Um, in your chemical engineer is fundamentally water treatment plants. Um, restore and improve urban infrastructure. Maybe. So if we had a million people living in a, in a very small space and we were trying to grow food for those people in situ, so probably on the side of their building rather than at a farm, how would you do that? Maybe plants on the side of the building or algae and some sort of process in the building to turn algae into not horrible tasting algae. Um, so chemical engineering around that improving urban infrastructure, it's kind of an aside, but everyone kind of has to work together to try and make that feasible because as millions and billions of people move towards the cities and as different areas get inundated with rising sea levels, then you're going to have to do different things with food. And chemical engineers are going to be really, really important for that. So at the very least, process. Um, advanced health informatics. So that is uh, Fitbits and much more advanced version of Fitbits. Any chemical engineering in that? Yeah, battery. That's a good one. So battery and whatever chemicals you're using in the battery for that sort of stuff. All of these new lithium ions and even more advanced batteries than lithium ions that make this stuff last forever. 
Um, and if you're going to put sensors inside the body rather than outside the body, you better hope that that battery life is a little bit better than your iPhone. Uh, and so the chemical engineer needs to be able to deal with that. All right, engineering better medicines. Chemistry, Chemistry absolutely. What else? Process. Process, yeah, so better medicines are great if you have one or two of them, but if you have millions of them, it's much better. Reverse engineering the brain. Chemistry? Yeah, so what's the brain? Basically a lot of chemistry and electrical charges and all sorts of things. So Prevent nuclear terror? Um, maybe. I don't know. Control systems? Yeah, probably. Nuclear terror, control systems. Um, Yeah, yeah, so the actual design of the bombs themselves is there's a lot of chemical engineering involved in that. Um, and so let's hope that the chemical engineers design them such that you can't um, press, press the go button if you're not the right person. Um, all right, secure cyberspace, probably more electrical. Uh, enhanced virtual reality, again, probably more electrical, maybe some materials and things for different incarnations of virtual reality, so we could potentially tick, you know, maybe process or something. Oh, hang on, wrong one. Uh, advanced personal learning, again, more electrical computer systems-y. Uh, engineer tool, engineering the tools for scientific discovery. There's definitely some, you know, chemical engineering to design different tools, materials, batteries, God knows what else, uh, to actually advance science. So there's lots of areas there that chemical engineering can have an influence over this stuff. All right, that's chemical engineering. Any questions on that before we talk quickly about electrical? No? Great. You guys are doing process engineering next semester with MADOC. That subject will give you a really good introduction to what practical chemical engineering is, certainly better than what I can give you. Hopefully this just gives you a bit of an overview of the types of jobs and areas that you might work if you chose chemical engineering. And certainly it'll give everyone else a little bit of exposure to that if you're not choosing chemical engineering as well. Uh, what I have now is our electrical subdisciplinary streams. You can see that electrical has a lot more subdisciplinary streams than does chemical or any other discipline. Um, the thing about electrical engineering is you can break electrical engineering up into a lot of different streams and then if you think about the electrical engineering in something like a car or a building or something like that, you find that a lot of these streams all then combine back together. All right, so you're not just going to be doing electronics. Electronics is going to be talking to power, is going to be talking to um, communication systems and all of that sort of stuff. So it, it all comes back together, um, but there is a defined boundary between these subjects. So that's why they're set up in streams like this. So we got engineering management. They do the same subjects as the MEX, so a little bit more management involved there because a lot of the time in mines and refineries and things, you might be dealing with asset maintenance and management and that kind of thing. We got computer systems, we got electronics, automatic control, power engineering and communication systems and I'll talk briefly about each of these. Alright, so uh, computers, what did I call it? Computing and systems basically follows EG1002. Alright, so EG1002 is how do you write software and how does that then talk to electronic devices? Well, you've got three subjects to get more and more advanced in that because whilst you guys are doing I think a centrifugal pump design thing or a centrifugal pump tester at the moment, uh, what you actually need to do is to be able to control very complex systems and write the software and have the electronics talk to the software and all of that kind of stuff. So you need to get more and more advanced in your software development as an electrical engineer because it's integral to all of electrical engineering. It's not just about you know, circuits working, it's about circuits working and being controlled by complex programs. Electronics. Uh, so this is the one where you, this is what you might think typically with electrical engineering. So this is your circuit boards and your resistors and your capacitors and your, you know, your silicon chips and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and anything from consumer goods and phones and computers and TVs and robots and 
uh, control circuits, um, ECUs in your car, that's all just circuitry. So all of this type of stuff is um, that electronics. So those subjects are, you know, what is a resistor, what is a capacitor, how do you actually make circuit boards, there's a lot of hands on and you guys start creating your own circuit boards. Um, the bottom left hand picture there is one of the robotics club here at JCU, one of their little competitions. They make these little robotic battle bots and racing bots and things that go around on tracks and more advanced things as you move along. Um, but so all of the electronics and things in those is that electrical circuits. Okay? Uh, and so if you're interested in electrical engineering, I highly recommend you, you contact the robotics club guys um, and get involved in that because it will really give you a good practical exposure nice and early on. And chances are if you do that, then the electric circuit stuff that you do in the degree will be uh, a heck of a lot easier because you will have already done half of it through the through robotics club uh, in a fun way as well. So. That's, that's electronic circuits and you know, your more traditional stuff is you know, your phones and TVs and, and that kind of stuff. But effectively anything with a circuit board that you open up and has a, you know, a, a, a resistor and capacitor and processors in it, that's electric circuits. Who designs it? Electrical engineers. All right? So you need, you need a circuit board to do a job. An electrical engineer has to take the input and the output and turn it into a circuit. And how do you do that? And so that's what those subjects are. Control systems. So we talked about control systems with our other disciplines. Everyone needs control systems. Everyone needs them from a, everyone needs to understand them from a uses standpoint if you're a mechanical or an elect, uh, a chemical. But an electrical engineer needs to understand them from a design so they do a little bit more. So the electrical engineer, generally speaking, will be the ones doing the electronics design and the power and things like that in the background. So they need to understand a little bit more about control systems than the rest of us. All right? So that's why there's two subjects there. But fundamentally, everything in almost everything these days is controlled by uh, electronics. Automatic control is more your process, just let it go until something breaks. Um, and so this, uh, this automatic control system subject is, is along those lines, or subjects. Power engineering, who knows what power engineering is? Who wants to work for Ergon? One, two, a couple more. Um, power engineering is, all right, electrical engineers deal with electricity. Power engineering is the upscaled, you know, how do we get it? Where does it come from? How do we use it? How do we get it from A to B? How do we manage it? Power engineering is everything electricity. All right? Um, and so that could be, this example's from Don McPhail. Um, he's, uh, he works for Ergon Energy. He's given a couple of guest lectures in this subject in the previous years and those videos are on LearnJCU. Um, the 2015 one is especially good, so please go and have a look at that. Uh, if, you, if you're on the fence about electrical engineering, it may well convince you because it's, it's very motivational. Um, but this is, this is from one of his slides about power engineering. So it could be generation and that generation could be dirty big coal power plant or it could be hydroelectricity, or it could be renewables, or it could be any other incarnation of where the power comes from. It could be transmission in terms of big transmission. So transmission from power plant to substation. And that's a really big issue with electricity and power, is how do you get it from where you produce it to where you need it with as little loss as possible. And that's a very, very challenging problem. All right, so the, one of the major losses in electricity is trying to just get it from the power station. It's why we don't go to the centre of Australia and have massive solar farms and then feed all of our cities from it because you'd lose most of the power by the time you got all, of, all the way into the city. Plus the infrastructure would be catastrophically expensive to get from that distance to where you, where you want to go. And the maintenance and all of that sort of stuff. So, how does that all work? Distribution is from your substation to your home. Billing and metering is in your home and how, you know, how much do you get charged and so forth. And that's, that's you guys, the end user. And so that's, that's a little bit on power, but also you've got power in sort of examples of trains and all sorts of public transport. Don gave the example that he was over, I think, I think when he was in the States, um, but you can watch the lecture. He was, he was dealing with uh, one of the major sports stadiums over there and 
the actual power in that sports stadium, how do you get all the power to the lights and how do you get all the power to the systems that need to operate and all of the TV room, you know, broadcast areas. It had its own sub-power grid and its own backup generators and its own, you know, independent grid of everything. And, and how does that work in a big building like that or in a high-rise? Or if you're talking about the, the um, Burj Khalifa in, in Dubai, 820 metres up, how do you get electricity all the way to the top? Do you just have one substation at the bottom or do you have all sorts of different metering and things going up and down? So planning that, designing that, that's power engineering. Last one, communication systems. Who's checked Facebook since they got to this lecture? Wi-Fi. Yeah? Or potentially 4G, 3G, 2G, 1G. Um, all of that is communication systems. So where does it come from? How do you send it? How do you get it? How do you receive it? How do you interpret that data? What sort of data packages do you get over Wi-Fi as opposed to Ethernet, as opposed to fibre optics, that kind of stuff? Um, radio frequency stuff, radar stuff, TV. Your TV's not hard plugged into anything. You're just getting it out of the air. How does your TV interpret it? How do you send it from a tower? What sort of messages? How do you get it to the tower in the first place? All of that is communication stuff. Um, satellites particularly, so communication to and from satellites and how do we use satellites in our day to day. So we have communication going through the air now that would boggle your mind. If you were to plug a TV in now, you would get every single TV station in this room. If you were to you know, plug a radio in, you'd get every single radio station. If you were to be a good hacker, you could just about get everything off the internet and get every single person's phone in this room. You know, all of the communication that is in the air right now is astonishing. And this part of electrical engineering is how do you pick out the one little message that you actually want out of that whole plethora of information that's bouncing around? And then how do you process it and then how do you send it on somewhere else? Okay, so there are huge examples of this. One really cool one that I like, have you guys seen this one? So um, CSIRO reckons we're hitting the bandwidth limitation of Wi-Fi. So if you go into a coffee shop in Sydney, that coffee shop and just about every other coffee shop in the district and every other office in the district all have Wi-Fi broadcasting. And so the bandwidth of you downloading your YouTube videos as opposed to someone else downloading their work or something in their office, we're reaching the maximum limitation of the range that Wi-Fi can serve. You can't just throw more Wi-Fi routers out there and have more people using it. You're going to run out of room in the air. Okay? And so where they're trying to go with it is, all right, what's an alternative to that? And this top right one's really interesting and kind of scary and I don't kind of like worried that everyone's going to have epileptic fits over it. But the idea is that instead of having Wi-Fi, the lights in your building flash at a really, really rapid rate. And they flash so fast that you can't even discern it with your eye, but that flashing is picked up by your device as the communication. So instead of having wi like your Wi-Fi router sending out whatever it is, you know, waves, radio frequency waves or whatever the spectrum is, you've got light, which is still a wave. So communication is just a wave through the air. It's just that um, now we're dealing with the visible spectrum rather than the, the other, the radio frequencies or whatever you're dealing with Wi-Fi. So it's the same concept. It's just in the visible spectrum. And you've got lights in every building. And assuming that you can do it quick enough that it doesn't like, give people migraine headaches or epileptic fits, then it's a pretty good idea. But it's a very interesting new sort of area of communication. And that's all communication uh, electrical engineering. Okay? So I thought that was one cool example. And then obviously you've got your satellites and your Ethernet communications and server farms and all the rest of it. There's lots and lots of examples of this communication and how you deal with that in circuits. All right, um, let's have a go at this one. Um, so get your sheet out and just think about some of those areas of electrical engineering and how they apply to the grand challenges. And then if we have time, I'll talk about a quick case study, which is Formula One car, which I like. There we go, there's electrical engineering there. OK, guys, in the interest of finishing up, uh, let's go through this quickly, hey? So, uh, 
Electrical engineering, how do electrical engineers make solar energy economical? What is solar energy? Electricity or power, basically. So at the very least, power engineering is maintenance of the grid, smart grid, you know. When you're producing solar energy on your roof and then feeding it back into the grid, Ergon have a big peak during the day with everyone feeding in and then big troughs at night when everyone's pulling out. So how do you manage that grid and when do you turn your power stations on and when do you turn it off? And uh, making it economical largely is making that grid work with renewables. So um, absolutely power engineering if nothing else. But probably also electronics in terms of you know, your meters and management devices and that kind of stuff and possibly even computing systems in so much as you're controlling where the energy is going on the grid and how that works. <laughs> Sorry? Automatic control within the manufacturing for solar energy? Yeah, probably that as well, you're right. Um, and communication systems if you really want to point to all of them uh, because you've got communication from the home back to you know, how are you getting the information about how much electricity you've used and when did you use and all of that kind of stuff. So all of those things would be ticked. Um, provide energy from fusion. Power. Fundamentally we're doing power, but we could probably tick all of those other ones as well in so much as controls and so forth. But um, let's just do that so we move through it quickly. Uh, carbon sequestration. Is electri electrical engineer doing anything with that? Control potentially. Um, at some point you need to use some electricity to squash this stuff down, so there's definitely going to be elect electrical engineering design in whatever system the chemical engineers come up with to pump this stuff into the ground. There's going to be plenty of electrical design in that as well. So potentially, you know, automatic control, maybe uh, electronics or power depending on what you're doing, but that's sort of a speculative kind of area. Managing the nitrogen cycle. Uh, short of maybe sensor technology, so maybe if you've got, you, you're putting some sensors around in different waterways and that kind of stuff to sense the nitrogen levels, that's definitely electrical engineering. Um, so maybe electronics and sort of um, communication systems. So there's definitely potential there for an electrical engineer to be involved. Uh, provide access to clean water. Probably less so directly, uh, but again, you could have control systems and things in, in, that, in that loop. Um, let's leave it blank. Restore and improve urban infrastructure. Power? Yeah, we definitely need power. Uh, everyone likes having lights and ovens and TVs. Um, what else? Communication. Communication systems? Yeah, probably. So you've got Wi-Fi and all sorts of things in your building. Um, You've also probably got PV on the roof or some sort of uh, wind turbines and all sorts of things in there. So there's lots of different areas of electrical engineering involved in that design. Uh, advanced health informatics. What's a Fitbit? Electronics? At the very least. I keep coming back to Fitbit. I'm not, I'm not getting sponsored by Fitbit. I just... <laughs> I think they're cool, but that's, that's, that's another story. Um, but yeah, a Fitbit's a good example that everyone has, but what we're actually talking about is like permanent heart monitors integrated into T-shirts for people with heart conditions and things like that. Like the, the sorts of things that can, can monitor your entire health level. So ideally, you'd have something on your person that would tell you if you had a heart condition or if you had an aneurysm or if you had cancer or if you had some sort of other health issue and it would just tell you straight away and you get straight off to the doctor. And we wouldn't need preventative medicine because your health informatics would do all of that for you. All right, so the, the, the end goal of that is that we have some sort of sensing technology on our body that tells us everything we need to know without ever going to a doctor. We only go to get fixed rather than tested. All right, so that's the idea and all of that's electronics and probably computer systems and various other communication systems as well. All right, engineering better medicines, probably not as much. Uh, reverse engineering the brain, what signals are in the brain? Electrical signals, yeah, so potentially. Um, and if we're going to remake a brain, then that's all circuitry. 
Um, reverse engineering the brain, there we go. So computer systems probably and electronics probably. Prevent nuclear terror. Yeah, probably communications probably, yeah. If you can block signals to it or kill it or something. Um, and maybe electronics as well, circuit boards and things in it that do things. Secure cyberspace. So what is cyberspace? Yeah, so potentially communications. We've also got some computer code, um, maybe even electronic circuits that you know protect and stop and things like that. Enhanced virtual reality, where you could almost tick all of them. Programming, circuits, communication is important. You probably need some power at some point, but mainly those three. Advanced personal learning, communication. Yep, uh, software. And engineering tools for scientific discovery, well, probably most of them. Cool? So there's little, little bits of electrical engineering in everything. Fundamentally, the main jobs that you'd be getting are around power engineering, ergon, and those sort of areas. Um, but there are a lot of really good sort of opportunities around fun stuff if you really work hard and, and find those jobs. Cool? All right, um, I won't go on to the next thing because we run out of time, so I'll talk about that another time. Um, otherwise, I'll see you guys on Monday for the quiz. Don't forget.